Because you're a girl and you're a boy. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Action. What did your dad like? He's funny. He's really funny. He's really funny. How is he funny? His dad jokes. You like his dad jokes? No. What are some funny things that your dad does? He claps really hard and, and mom doesn't like it. He claps really loud. Yeah, like this. Wow. Wow. What is your dad good at? Working. He's really good at fixing things and building things. He usually goes to the fast food place to get his breakfast. What do you normally know eat? Uh, biscuits and waffles. It's a lot of carbs. Is there stuff that he's not very good at? He's not very good at wrestling, yes. Three against one. Yeah. <laughs> he's not that good at hair. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, I thought you were about to say, was that a song you were singing? Um, no. <laughs> oh. What's something he's done? You're like, Dad is not very good at that. Jokes. Jokes. <laughs> is your dad pretty strong, dude. Yeah, because he always goes to CrossFit every day. So he's a CrossFit dad. He's like, explore! To do he's that. Like, uh, you do an impersonation of your dad. I'm just going to rest my eyes. <laughs> is there anything that your dad has taught you? Nope. What, is it, what does he teach you? Fighting. Sight words. I copy him to do what he does. And yeah, you copy him. I just do stuff to make myself learn from him. What's your favorite thing to do with your dad? Snuggle and talk with stuffed animals. Go fishing. Play wrestle with me. When you get on his back, you like yank the off of him. How does your dad make you feel? Special? Happy. He makes me hungry from his delicious food. He makes sure we're safe. He makes me happy. Yeah, that's what he makes me feel like. Good job, bro. Hey, yeah, give them a big clap, those children. And uh, we want to say we, we love you dads, and we're glad to see people here with their dads. I see a few people have brought dad along or a few daughters and sons have come along with Dad today. And uh, so good to be able to be in worship together on, on Father's Day. And uh, before we get into the message today, though, we should have a little bit of fun on Father's Day in church. And so I've even got some, uh, some favourites today for a, a, a Father's Day quiz. Now, this will test uh, people's knowledge. Sorry. Just had to get the microphone out of the way and uh, didn't do a very good job of it. <laughs> Hope it still works, uh, Ben. <laughs> um, so it was still on too and you can hear it go boom on the ground. But uh, yes, this will test people's knowledge but it will also see who watches the most TV and who's uh, most up to date with the latest trends. So we've got a prize. If you can guess, that before the kids go out to their programs today, uh, if you can guess what the dad's name is in all of these families that we're going to put up on the screen. So uh, are you ready? We're going to put the dads up and I want to see a hand. Uh, the first hand I saw up, honestly, was Stephen Parker. So who is it? Homer who? Can you? I don't know how am I throwing it. Whoa! No. Oh! Rebecca got it. All right, well, the next one is, who is the dad in this show? Yes, Alan. It's, you got Jed right anyway. Uh, yeah, that's right. I forgot their last names. It's from, of course, it's from the Beverly Hillbillies. So those of you who are a little uh, no, that young at heart will remember that one. So there's, there's one of these for you. All right. Oops, well done. Um, I hope none of mine gets hurt by my throwing today. The next one is uh, sort of from my era growing up. Does anyone remember the dad in this show? Okay, I think I saw Mark Morton's hand go up first. Mark, I can't throw that far. Mike Brady. Mike Brady. And what's the show called? The Brady Bunch. Da, 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 da. Who else remembers the Brady? No, I don't think Ebony remembers the Brady Bunch. All right. So who can give, who, who's, who can come and, oh. 
I'm going to kill somebody with a chocolate in a moment, sorry. All right, another one from my era growing up. This family, who remembers dad in this? No, you've had one. Okay, over here, first time dad today. First time dad with, uh, here today, so Father's Day, first time Father's Day. Andrew? I better just check my notes. I've got down Steve Keaton from the show Family Ties. Okay, Andrew, I'll, I'll move around. Okay, well done. What about the next one? Who knows the, who knows the dad in this, fam, in this picture? Recently deceased. Oh, I, I did see. I did see. No? Okay. Who's dad in this family? Okay, I heard someone say Prince Philip. Who was that? Who yelled it out? Oh, you want a chocolate, don't you? All right, there you go. Oh, sorry. Actually, you're right. Wendy just pointed out there's actually three dads in that fam- royal family picture, so we could have had uh, yeah, Charles or, or William, but anyway. So now I was looking for Prince Philip. He was the, the patriarch of that uh, f- family that he's most known for, its matriarch. All right, what about this one? I've never actually seen this show, but I looked it up. The dad is called... No one wants to admit. <laughs> the name's Peter, isn't it? You say, yes, all right, there we go. Thank you. Oh, my throwing is bad. Uh, what, about, what about this next one? Again, you've got to be a little bit uh, older to remember this one. Who knows the show, first of all? Eight is Enough. And I do remember watching this when I was uh, a lad on the black and white TV. And the dad is named... Does anyone remember the dad in Eight is Enough? I'm going to look over towards the... Anyone? No? Oh, I'm going to have that chocolate, I think. Okay, it was Tom Bradford. Eight is enough, Tom Bradford. Well, the next show should have a few of us guess. Who's the dad in this show? All right, I reckon I could see Emma's hand go up. Fred Flintstone. Well, look, he's a crunchy for you, Emma. All right, and the next one up on the screen, and we'll look for the quickest hand to go up, is Tia. Ozzy Osbourne, chocolate for me. All right, okay, we're having fun in church today. All right, who knows the dad? And now this one is going to test uh, our TV memories. The show is called Father Knows Best, and I think it was on black and white TVs only, wasn't it, in Australia? All right, no one can remember who the dad is? Oh, Alan knows his real name. Oh, okay, well, oh, there's another one for me. Jim and Margaret Anderson were the parents in that show, I think. There we go. Oh, well, this one, Wendy and I had the joy of visiting uh, Highclere Castle, where these people sort of lived. Who remembers the name of the father? Oh, I can see Pauline with a hand up. Lord Grantham? Yes, that'll probably do. Uh, Yes, Robert Crawley, but yes, he was always called Lord Grantham, so you can have a dream. All right, now while I'm a bit closer, who knows who the dad is in this show? This is the worst show for honouring dads that I've ever seen, I think. (laughs) Anyway, okay, I can see Kate hand up. I can see Al Bundy. From Married with Children. Yes, you're going to win a prize in the next one. Oh, goodness. This is taking longer than I thought. Anyway, sorry, God. Okay, does anyone know this show? Oh, this is an Australian show. This is an Australian show, isn't it? Packed to the rafters? Who knows the dad? Just first name will do. Now, yes, right at the very back, Dave is his name in Packed to the Rafters. Good Aussie show, there's a picnic for you, Esther. (laughs) All (laughs) righty. We're not non-political in this church, but you know who this is, don't you? You're going to tell me who it is? Yeah. I heard that name. Yeah, yeah, all right, there you go. ScoMo. And the next famous, well, he was famous. Um, li- this is from, ah, 
This is taking you back. Wendy's got it right. It is the little town on the prairie. The little house on the prairie, yeah. The little house on the prairie. The family's name are the Ingalls. Does anyone know Dad's name? Did I, did I hear someone say Charles? No. Well, there's another one for me. <laughs> All right, we're nearly done. We're nearly done. We're nearly done. I know this is fun and we're having a good time on Father's Day. Do you know this one, Mr. David Cool? I saw that hand. Very keen on Father's Day. It is, it is, no, it's not the Adams family, but you're right. It's Herman Munster. Herman Munster. You're absolutely right. And uh, I don't know which ones of these you like, but I feel like you need a bit of a boost. It's been a big week for the family this week, hasn't it, David? So there you go. Yeah, all right. Well, there you go. We can, um, that was a bit of fun. It's just good good for us to to have a little bit of fun on Father's Day and to honour, just to recognise the fact that every family is a little bit different. And so just before the kids go on out to their program, just want to acknowledge today that it's his Father's Day and we do honour dads today, all the dads that are here, all the grandpas that are here, and uh, and all the young people who aspire to being dads one one day. But we also recognise that every family is a little different and there are families where, where dad's passed on or where dad's not around. Uh, and uh, we just acknowledge that and we just hold that intention today and we're also going to be remembering that whatever situation we're in, uh, whatever our experience of fatherhood has been as a dad or of our dads, uh, we remember that we have a very, very good and perfect heavenly father who loves us and we can really honour and worship him on Father's Day. So, yeah, give a clap to all the dads as we let the children head on out to One Way for your programs today. For all the kids, so you can head on out now to your special programs. All right. I think you guys enjoyed those quizzes more than you let on. Even the big people. They were the ones who put their hands up for all those old shows. And, uh, yeah. What's that? I enjoyed it. I got the most chockies, I think. So, uh, anyway. (laughs) What have I got them up here for? I can't eat them while I'm preaching. All right. There they go. Okay, just quickly though, uh, before we get into the word, I want to, I want to um, just acknowledge uh, today's Father's Day service. Tonight we're, we have a continuing our Cafe Church series, so if you're here tonight, we'll be continuing the Father's Day theme, but in more of a discussion as well tonight at 5pm uh, in A2 in the back hall. And also want to remind you just to remember to, to, to give. There are lots of ways that you can give to support the work of the church and the ministries here at Springwood. Uh, of course, there are boxes near the exits, and you can give online. There's even an app uh, in, through which you can give, um, or, or a website. If you go to our website uh, or the newsletter, you can find details for online giving. Next Saturday is a working bee at the church in the morning, so 7 a.m. start. David will be supervising that working bee next week. Wendy and I will actually hoping, uh, God willing, that we'll be in Uluru next weekend for a week's holiday. So we're looking forward to that. But the working bee here at uh, 10, uh, 7 a.m. next week. And next Sunday night, we, um, we have our Activate Nights, once, usually once a month. But we've got that next week. And we have some guests from uh, C- Caleb and Linda Moore from... Kenmore Church of Christ will be our special guests on that night for our Activate Night next Sunday night. And there's an important date claimer. If you haven't already got this in your minds, get these two dates in your minds. They are in the newsletter as well. October is not far away now. In fact, it's next month. And uh, isn't that a bit scary, isn't it? So next month is uh, heading towards Jeff's retirement as a, as a staff salaried pastor here at Springwood Church and Jeff and Wendy have been a part of this church in ministry for 41 years and have had connections with the church even longer than that. So on the October 8, a Saturday night, get this date, is a church family night and I just want to let you know what's happening on the 8th so that you can be aware and get the word out and we'll also get some emails out this week. It's going to be pretty much a good old style church family night with a bit of fun uh, and, and some good fellowship together, Fa- church family night, and we're wanting to make this as affordable as possible for families. So it's a bring a plate, sort of a light tea or supper on that night on the 8th 
of October, the Saturday night. So we can all come to the church, uh, bring a plate, a plate to share. Uh, we'll, we'll send some emails with details about what sort of foods are, are best for that. But yeah, bring a plate to share and we'll have a shared, you know, what church, what have they used to call them, hot pot or whatever. Yeah, potluck supper or something. See what you come and get. And uh, it'll be on that Saturday night. And that'll be fun. But then the following Sunday morning, the 16th, is actually Jeff's last Sunday uh, as, uh, as pastor here at the church. And he'll be preaching on the 16th of October on the Sunday morning. Jeff Greenaway, come on up just for a minute. It's, uh, the bush bash is getting underway and Jeff's been actually going out bush a bit. Jeff's, if you don't know Jeff, he's one of our... Oh, I've thrown the microphone away. Here you go, Jeff. Jeff, um, Jeff's been doing a bit of preaching out bush at, at Bonjean recently, but he's also helping coordinate the Bush Bash Christmas for the Bush. That's correct, yeah. So we're, we're, for those people who are interested in coming along, um, we now have dates set. We're le- we should meet up in Charleville on the 19th of November, and we should be back here by about the 2nd or 3rd of December. So if you want to come, let us know. We have a few places where we can use a few extra people. So um, that would be great. Um, but keep those dates in mind. We meet up on the 19th of November and we should be home by about the 3rd of December. So um, that's all for today. We'll have a bit more coming up, a few more videos or something. And... Okay. Yes, I know. It's something that the church has been getting behind over quite a number of years yes. now. And uh, so, yeah, just be aware that it's coming. Those are the dates if you wanted to join on the team or find out more, see Jeff. And I'll just add one more thing. If don't, don't matter whether you're older or younger, older like me or younger like some of the other people on the team. Um, someone said to me when we were out of Bonjean, I'd love to go, but I've got little kids. Well, remember that um, Candace and Paul, their two little ones have grown up on the bush bash, been there for every year of their life. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're young and have little kids come along and uh, uh, share a great time and meet a lot of new people. And you've taken a teenager with you a few times too. Yes, we're about five years. So just and the Bush Bash has been going now. This is the 10th anniversary. So wow. 10 years. So um, it's been All doing right, a lot. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. Thank you. All right. Yes, thank you for carefully putting... Lord God, we, uh, we now come to your word and we pray that uh, you would speak to us as we open our spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear Jesus, to see and hear your word for us for today. Lord, encourage us with these words and uh, we, we, just, uh, we commit this time to you, Lord, and say, uh, speak now, your, your servant is listening. Amen. Well, way back in the 1980s, uh, I was a bit of a fan of Amy Grant, uh, one of the Christian gospel singers or Christian artists of the time, and she wrote a song that uh, has always stayed, stayed with me. It was called My Father's Eyes. And in the song, she, these, are the, these are the lyrics of the song. I may not be every parent's dream or mother's dream for her little girl, And my face may not grace the mind of everyone in the world, but that's all right. As long as I can have one wish, I pray. When people look inside my life, I want to hear them say, she's got her father's eyes, her father's eyes. Eyes that find the good in things when good is not around. Eyes that find the source of help when help just can't be found. Eyes full of compassion. Seeing every pain, knowing what you're going through, and feeling it the same, just like my father's eyes. And she's talking about her heavenly father. And her heart's desire as a young woman growing up was that when people looked into her eyes, looked at her, they would see that she has her father's eyes, that she would see things the way God sees things that she would treat others the way God the Father treats others. You know, as I look back at at my dad, I know in my father's eyes I saw a zest for life and a love for the Lord and, and a passion to serve. I saw 
a man who loved the Lord and who cared about people and who loved me. I saw something of, in his eyes that was, uh, was reflecting something even bigger. Sadly, he's passed away and I indulged a little bit this morning by uh, singing the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee, the, the hymn that I sang at, at Dad's funeral just uh, under two years ago. But uh, you know, when Dad was a younger man, there was a zest for life in his eyes, and I saw that in him. And there's so many good memories of my dad as I grew up. That Dad, coming back from America back in the 70s after doing some studies over there and, and taking me out for breakfast, because that's what they did in America, he said, in America. So he you know, we were going out for breakfast. I remember him picking me up from high school in the brand new Chrysler Charger and surprised us all. We're thinking, we're going, hey, Charger. Does anyone else remember that or was that just, hey, Charger? That's what they did on the ads, on the TV. And it was Dad in the hey, Charger. It was pretty cool. I remember sitting on the hill of the SCG watching Dennis Lilly race into bowl. Was sailing out on Brighton Beach in the boat that Dad bought for the family when he traded in a hobby uh, res- um, restoring of a motorcycle for a boat because it's something that we could all do together. And we went sailing. And I remember standing in the front of a church when I went forward in response to a gospel message and decided to follow Jesus, and Dad was there. And then 10 years later, standing at the front of the chapel, He was there preparing to conduct a wedding service as my wife, Wendy, walked down the aisle. Lots of great memories of Dad, even though sadly dementia and then uh, death took him to be with his Lord forevermore. Being a dad brings a lot of great joys too. It brings joys and sorrows. It can be both. There are highs and lows. There are so many joys, but there are tough times as well. So many highs, bringing a baby home from the hospital, you know, Father's Day at Kindy, remember those days, school musicals, high school formals, university graduations, when you see them at performances or see them playing sport and you're standing on the sidelines cheering them on as they kick the ball or as they play that game of sport and then now as they're younger seeing them productively in, in their work life and their professional life growing in, uh, as adults, but there are tough times too, and I'm sure many of you have had tough times as a dad visiting a child in hospital, getting that call to come and meet with the principal, <laughs> um, and st- all the, just the stuff of life, arguments with teenagers, the full range of emotions that are experienced in the home and are experienced by a father. But as a dad, my prayer is still, even as an an older dad with adult kids, my prayer is still a little like that song of Amy Grant, that my kids would see in me a glimpse of my heavenly father, that they might say, he's got his father's eyes. So friends, as we uh, continue in worship this morning, what do we see when we look into our heavenly father's eyes? What characteristics do we see in God our Father when we look towards him? Well, first of all, and, and this, these are really important characteristics. It's so important that we get a, a godly, biblical uh, understanding of the nature of, of God the Father, of who he is. Many of us have distorted pictures of who God the Father really is. We see him as a as a strict schoolmaster or as a, you know, the one who dishes out punishment and judgment. And so we've got to get a balanced biblical understanding of just who God the Father is. And when we know who God is, then we come to him at our times of doubt, our times of when we've gone away and need to come back. We come back to him because we know who he is. We know what he's like. We know his character, and we can bank on it. So when I look into my father's eyes, talking about God the Father, I see a loving God. Psalm 103 and verse 13 says that as, the father, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. 
There's a direct link made in this beautiful psalm, Psalm 103, between God, an earthly father, and a heavenly father. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on his children, on us. And in the New Testament, in 1 John 3, and 1 John is all about the love of God the Father. Read 1 John again. It's so much about God as love. And God the Father as being a God of love. And we read these famous words. We used to sing them. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. We are his children. And what incredible love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Perfect love, it says in the next chapter. A perfect love which casts away all fears. When we look into our Father's eyes, when we get a balanced biblical understanding of the nature of God the Father, we see a God of love. We can actually flick through the pages of Scripture and find in Exodus and in other places, it's almost a self-description where God gives a self-description of his character, of his nature. So in Exodus 34, it says that the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with um, Moses and proclaimed his name. The Lord, Yahweh. And Exodus 34, verse 6, And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellious, and sin. I haven't put those words on the screen, but those, those words are a self-description by God revealing himself uh, revealing his character to Moses with those, those words, those sentiments. And we see that he is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. And so when I look at God, my father, I see a, a loving God. A God who smiles upon me. A God who loves me, despite the fact that I'm not always necessarily lovable. But that love continues. He's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Great aspirations for us earthly dads as well to be like him in the way we treat our children to be primarily, first and foremost, a loving father. That's who our God is. Slow to anger, not quick with anger. Abounding in love. But secondly, when I look into my father's eyes, I see a faithful God. A faithful God. A God who can be relied upon. A God who can be trusted, a father who can be trusted to follow through on his promises. A God who, if he's going to be, he says he's going to be there, will be there. If he says he's going to do something, will do it. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the faith that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. It's a great line. He who promised, our God who promised is faithful. Faithful, He will see it through. We can stand on the promises of God. We can take a hold, believe firmly the promises of God because he is faithful and trustworthy. Another passage says that if we give up on him, he does not give up on us. For he cannot be false to himself. That's 2 Timothy 2 verse 13 in one of the modern translations. Even if we are not faithful, he will still be faithful. And he'll be faithful to follow through with his promises. And his character is faithful. He's true. He's not fickle. He won't be one person today and another person tomorrow, depending on his mood and how he woke up in the morning. God, our Father, is reliable and trustworthy, faithful. And so when I look into my father's eyes, God, my father's eyes, I see a God who is faithful. But also when I look into my father's eyes, I see an approachable 
God. Our God is approachable. And again, for us earthly fathers, we, uh, we aspire to be, we want to be, we need to be uh, approachable so that our children, when they're facing fears, when they're facing peer pressure, when they're dealing with difficult stuff at school or at work or wherever it might be in the playground, that they will know that there's a father that they can go to who is approachable, who is, uh, who is going to listen, who is going to care not going to be so scared of coming to their father that they will hold it all in. Um, in Hebrews chapter 4, we read about the great high priest uh, as a, another description of who our, who our Jesus is. But we read here that we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted just as we are and did not sin. Then verse 16 says, Then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In one of the modern translations, the message, it puts it like this and it's on the screen. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. So let's walk right up to our God and approach the throne of grace. And get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy Accept the help. So there's a description of who Jesus is, but there's also an exper- a, a de- depiction of God's throne of grace. And we can come boldly before the throne of grace. If we have a distorted picture of the character, the nature of God the Father, when we make mistakes or are going through hard times or if we feel ashamed or if we're hurting and struggling, We'll shy away from being real with God. We'll play pretend games. We'll put on a religious front. Or we'll turn the other way in shame and turn our back on him forever. If we don't have an accurate, balanced, biblical understanding of the character and the nature of God the Father, then when we are down, when we are struggling or hurting, Or sinning, we're going to turn away. But if we know who God is, if we know that He is approachable, if we know that we, when we know that God is really approachable, we will come to Him when we're down, knowing that we will receive what? We will receive grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Probably the greatest biblical example of of this father who is approachable is the the picture that we have in the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal father, the prodigal son. The son goes far away, takes his inheritance early, squanders his inheritance in wild living, in sinful life really, bottom line. He gets to the end of his tether and his money's run out and he's got a rotten job feeding the pigs and he's so hungry that he's eaten the food, wants to eat the food that they're giving to the pigs. His life's an absolute mess. He thinks, what can I do? And then he remembers his father. Whilst he has gone away from his father, whilst he has turned his back, whilst he has sinned, he he knows that his father is approachable. And so he gets up the courage, despite his shame, to go back to his father he makes up a spiel in his mind of what he's going to say to his dad. He's going to apologize and say, look, if you just treat me like a servant, please just give me a job as a servant. At least I'll have a roof over my head and at least I'll have some food to eat. But as he gets near the house, the father, the Bible says the father's on the porch waiting and he's watching and he's hoping. I don't know. And he sees the sun when he's far off. He doesn't even wait for the sun to come to him because he gathers up his garments and in a very undignified but incredibly passionate and loving way, he runs toward this broken life of his son and embraces him, puts his arm around him and kisses him and puts a ring on his finger and says, let's throw a party because this son of mine who was lost has been found. He's home, he's back. At least the son had enough of a relationship with his father, knowledge of his father's character, that when everything was down, 
he knew that he could approach his father. He did so humbly. He, you could say he, he repented. He turned from his wicked ways. He came back and the father was there to embrace him. It's incredible. It's a story worth remembering on a father's day. Our God is an approachable God. When I look into my father's eyes, I see this loving God. I see this faithful God. I see an approachable God. I see an understanding God. He understands us. I know the kids aren't all here. They've gone out to programs today, but kids, are, kids sometimes forget that their parents actually have been kids once before too. And they've been teenagers, and they've been young adults, and they probably know a lot more than what their young people uh, will give them credit for. Isn't that true? I remember when, you were, when, you were, when I was a teenager, um, thinking that, you know, mum and dad knew nothing at all. And then I became an adult, and I got married, and had my own family, and a mortgage, and all those things, and... Suddenly I looked to mum and dad and thought, gee, they've learned a lot in the last five or six years, haven't they? <laughs> Realised they knew a bit more than what I'd given them credit for knowing when I was a teen. But our God is an understanding God. Psalm 139 says, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from far off. You understand my thoughts afar off. Other scriptures say that you have searched me, Lord. You know me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You discern my going out, my lying down. In verse 16, you saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. God, our Father, knows us and he understands us. And if you're going through a hard time right now, God understands that pain. He knows what you're going through. And again, because he's a loving God and a faithful God and an approachable God, if you're going through those times right now, you can come to him and you can experience his wisdom and his help and his care, his kindness, his love, his forgiveness, if that's what you need, because he's an understanding God. He understands life for you. He understands what you're going through. I think it's important, though, to add in uh, Fifth point here is that when I look into my father's eyes, I do see that he is also a guiding father or a guiding God. There is, the role of, there is an important part of the role of a father of guiding children in the right direction. That includes bringing discipline to help a child or a young person to grow up in the right way. And that's why we read in Hebrews chapter 12 that we... It's just addressing Christians, saying we should endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. God is interested in our sanctification, in our spiritual growth. He's more interested in that than just our comfort and ease. God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And I know it was a slightly different generation that I grew up in, but I remember uh, one or two occasions where uh, I got into trouble, whether it was at the principal up at the school or whether it was dad. And I remember when, one time being in trouble with dad. It was one of those cases of mum saying, all right, usually mum would dish out a bit of discipline. She, she, was, uh, she was good at that, but um, when it was something really serious, it was like... Uh, Wait till your father gets home. Okay, so that's a long wait for a little boy. And I remember getting into really big trouble this time because I'd wandered off, literally wandered off, with my two brothers and the dog 
to go and visit my friend who lived up the road and around the corner. I was probably about 12. My little brothers were probably, yeah, six and nine or something. Our Pekingese dog dragged along. Which is all very well, except that I hadn't told mum and dad where I was going, and I was there for a long time, and they were sort of going, Where, where's the kids? Where's da? They were just about to ring the police when my friend's mum uh, thought, I'd better just ring Dale's mum and let him know that he's... It. So when I finally got home, it was, wait till your father gets home. But I remember being in big trouble, because mum and dad were we're just worried. They just were so glad to see us, but... They sort of showed it in a funny way, hey, you know, like. <laughs> but no, seriously, I do remember my dad. And dad, uh, dad, many of you know, dad was a pastor at the, at the time we were at Hawthorne Church of Christ in, in South Australia. And uh, he, we, he sat me down and he got his Bible out. And uh, I remember him looking up a verse that said something like, uh, he who spares the rod spoils the child. I remember something along the lines of these words, um, son, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it's going to hurt you. (laughs) You've heard those lines before. I probably used those lines myself. (laughs) Anyway, I got the usual, it wasn't, not not usual, I got the very rare occasion of, uh, you know, of, of some discipline that taught me right from wrong, that it is, you know, that when you do the wrong thing, there are consequences in life. Uh, and that's, a, that's an important lesson to learn when you're a young kid. If you do something that's wrong, if you go against the guidelines in this society or in God's world, there's consequences. And you know, it's an important lesson for us even in the church that when we go against God's ways and God's standards, even though we can receive full pardon from God, sins forgiven, clean and a home in heaven, there are still consequences in this life sometimes for the things that we do when we go our own way, when we go against God's ways, even though we're forgiven. And it's the same in this case for me and dad. So discipline is important. God sometimes disciplines his children. There are things that happen to us that bring us back to our knees. There are things that occur in our lives that make us realize that because of the the consequences of the situation that we've been involved in that brings us back to God in the first place and brings us back to our knees and brings us back to a place where we're willing to receive from Him. And we should endure hardship as discipline. God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. As it read in Hebrews 12, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on. It produces a harvest of righteousness. And of course, we're not talking about an excuse for violence. We're not talking about acting in anger. We're talking about parents with children acting in measured ways to bring about a desired outcome of better behaviour, of learning right from wrong. But finally, and I want to finish on this point, when I look into my father's eyes, I see, I see a giving God. A God who gives and gives and gives. Gives till it hurts. Who gives and gives and gives. Mercy and love, forgiveness and kindness to his children. Galatians 4, 7 puts it like this. So then you are no longer a slave, but a child. We are called children of God. We sing about God our Father. That's who you are. We are children of God. So then you are no longer slaves but a child. And since you are his child, God will give you all that he has for his children. And we come to God in faith, repentance. We get to know God as our Father. We get to become his children. To those who receive him, to those who who believe in his name to those he gives the right to become children of God. And when we're his children, we are co-heirs with Jesus. And we receive so many good gifts from the hand of a loving Father God. Matthew 7, these are the words of Jesus. These are teachings of Jesus. And he says says to those that are dads, he says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks for fish, 
Will you give him a snake? If he asks for McDonald's, will you... No, that's, that's another story, isn't it? But, but no, did you... if your son asks, you know, you want to give good gifts to your children. You want to make sure they've got good food to eat. You want to make sure that they've got what they need. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So our God just gives and keeps on giving. Grace. Forgiveness. Mercy. Blessing. Love. Answers to prayer, eternal life, spiritual gifts. Indeed, in Ephesians, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm is given as a gift to those of us who know Jesus as our Savior and God as our Father. Our God just gives and keeps on giving. He is a giving God. And in His eyes... We see the God of love, the God of faithfulness, a God who is approachable, a God who is understanding and guiding and giving. There was another song in the 1980s that touched my heart, uh, by, this time by a, a singer by the name of uh, Sandy Paddy. I used to think that's what you would call your hamburger if you dropped it down at the beach. But Sandy Patty wrote a beautiful song. No, seriously, it's a beautiful song. I used to sing this when I was a younger man. Um, and, it, and it included these words. It was, it was called in heaven's, in heaven's Eyes. And the chorus went like this. In heaven's eyes, there are no losers. In heaven's eyes, no hopeless cause. Only people like you, with feelings like me, amazed by the grace that we find in heaven's eyes. My prayer is that whatever you're going through today, whether life is difficult or easy, whether the emotions that you're facing are tough emotions or smooth and easy emotions, that you would look deeply into the eyes of God the Father and find the grace that you need today to live for him. And that you'll find joy where there's sadness. You will find peace where there's turbulence. You will find love where there's only been words of hate. Or put down, you will find grace and mercy to help you in your time of need because we can be amazed at the grace that we'll find in heaven's eyes. So, this Father's Day, we get to celebrate not only our earthly dads and whether they're past, have passed, or whether they're here with us or to celebrate our family life, but we get to celebrate that we have a good, good Father. Jesus taught us to pray to God as our Father, to know Him as a Father God. And when we get that biblical picture of just who God is, that the character of God the Father, we'll be blessed. We can draw on that. Even if our own experiences of dad or a fatherhood as a dad have been difficult, we can look to God our Father and find great comfort, love and grace in his eyes. Amen. Can I ask the band to come on up and lead us in our final song? And we're going to finish with a song that uh, won't be a surprise to you today. It's a song we've done a bit over the last few years. A good, good father. That's who he is. And we are his children. And that's who we are.